Let's talk about the massages. Okay. Watching the content yesterday, it was disturbing. It was wrong. It was wrong that I ever put anybody in that position. It was the wrong thing to do. I'd never do it today. Welcome everybody to episode 87 of the Lupa Paula Show. Um, what I want to talk about today, what I've been meaning to talk about for the past couple days, um, this is documentary, this Nickelodeon uh, documentary about Nickelodeon growing up in the uh, late 1990s uh, to the early and then late 2000s. It's called Quiet on the Set. And upon hearing about this, uh, my fiance and I, we watched all of it the past two days. Um, and what it's basically about is uncovering uh, terrible, heinous acts of, of pedophilia uh, from people that worked not only on the Nickelodeon set, but also interacted with all the child stars, um, and in some cases, committing various acts of sexual violence, uh, sexual misconduct, uh, very, very bad acts, criminal acts. Um, three cases, in fact, three separate members of uh, the crew that worked on these Nickelodeon shows were actually convicted pedophiles. Um, this is a real thing, and so... I just want to get into it here. Um, might as well, right? <clears throat> so here it is. So this is a uh, just an article from the Times to sum everything up. <clears throat> so this is quiet on the set. Uh, dark side of kids TV. Five takeaways. The investigation discovery documentary takes a look at accounts of a problematic working environment at Nickelodeon. And so you see right here, the perpetrator of all of this is a man named Dan Schneider. And so if you don't know who Dan Schneider is, he was the producer of all these TV shows, uh, from Mike Carly to Drake and Josh to The Amanda Show, and so on and so forth. He's basically responsible for all of the success at Nickelodeon. And you see this in the documentary, too. He, um, gosh, there's so many examples of just a toxic work environment that they, that they talk about that they attribute to Dan Schneider. Uh, there is, in the first episode, there's four episodes. In the first episode, there's two female writers, and they go on to talk about how he made them split a annual salary of that which would have been for men. Uh, he made them split it, and so they had to work for half their pay. There were times and stuff like that where they wouldn't be compensated for, like, extra working hours. And one of the female writers in particular, she was, um, she had to go to the hospital and he kind of gave her a hard time for it. Something happened where she, uh, you know, a minor injury. He kind of gave her a hard time for it. He, uh, a bunch of the cast, uh, directors of the shows talk about how he would verbally berate people, sometimes fire people on the spot. And so this guy right here, Dan Schneider, was the main perpetrator of all this. And so you see a couple people. You see uh, Jeanette McCurdy. You see, I forget what the guy's name that played the iCarly's older brother. Uh, you see Miranda Cosgrove. And then I also forget the actor that played um, iCarly and uh, uh, Sam's friend. Anyway, <clears throat> so once again, this is an article from the Times here. It says, The Investigation Discovery Documentary Quiet on Set, The Dark Side of Kids TV, is a four-part series about working at Nickelodeon, including the environment under the former producer Dan Schneider, and what some described as harmful situations that child actors and adult employees were put in. It, it's not some described, it definitely is. And I'll, I'll talk about this more as we really get into it. But people like Drake Bell, people like Amanda Bynes, uh, child stars at Nickelodeon. What Now, Amanda Bynes wasn't in the documentary, but people like Drake Bell, what he says or what comes out, what he reveals uh, that one of the producers did to him, it's, it's horrible. And he couldn't even describe it. He couldn't even put it into words because he was so traumatized by it. So it's not some describe. It is harmful and as painful as heinous acts. So Schneider, who parted ways with Nickelodeon in 2018, doesn't appear in the docuseries, but former writers, child stars, staffers, and journalists paint a picture at the environment uh, at the network star in the 90s through his departure. Schneider responded to the series in the video Tuesday, watching over the past two nights is very difficult, me facing my past behavior, some of which are embarrassing, and I regret. And I definitely owe some people a pretty strong apology, Schneider said. In a 20-minute uh, video posted to his YouTube channel, now, we'll, we'll look at that too. Um, actually, we'll take a look at that right now, because I, I did want to uh, point this out. His uh, response was very interesting, so we're going to look at it right now. We'll, we'll play it real quick. So this is his response, okay? Uh, just a clip, and he posted, like I said, this, this clip on his YouTube channel, but this is what's taken on X. Watching over the past two nights is very difficult. Me facing my past behaviors, 
Let's let's get something clear real quick. Let's get something clear real quick, real quick. This guy who's interviewing him, this guy right here, this black dude, he is actually a former employee of Nickelodeon. It wasn't. It was. It was a softball interview, basically. This guy right here, if you look, he played the smoothie guy and he played the donut guy and, and a bunch of probably other roles too, small roles on iCarly. This is a former employee in Nickelodeon, somebody who I would assume is good friends with Dan Schneider. I watched the whole interview. We're not going to watch it here, but Dan Schneider was this guy who was in charge of everything. And, and so you would think that he would get uh, less of a softball type of interview. Um, we'll watch it. We'll rewind it. And we'll see what you guys think. Like I said, not the whole thing. Watching over the past two nights is very difficult. I mean, facing my past behavior. Um, some of which are embarrassing and that I regret, and I definitely owe it to people a pretty strong apology. It's not exactly what I wanted to look at, but look, okay, so right here, uh, Dan Schneider, the former Nickelodeon producer at the center of the documentary, shared how he felt after being accused of sexism, racism, and inappropriate workplace behavior, and that's another thing, so they have like eight former child stars that came, and uh, specifically the black child stars would say that Dan Schneider, like he treated them different. Um, there was one of the one of the um, male child stars who said that he wasn't given as long of a leash as like the other stars on the uh, on the Nickelodeon shows. Uh, he was on all that, which was like their version of like SNL, uh, but for kids. Said how like he didn't even know that he was out. He got um, like a letter in the mail. He didn't after two seasons. They they fired him or Dan Schneider fired him. Uh, didn't even give him a chance to like say goodbye to all of his friends that he made on the set. Nothing. He was just given a letter and that was it. But this this uh, kid's mom, which I, I'm blanking on the the child actor's name, but this mom was uh was seeing all this and seeing how the like, Dan Schneider and and some of the producers on the set like something wasn't right. But what they would do at, at Nickelodeon was they would create these like weird situations where they would have the child actors turn on their parents uh, because the parents rightfully so were concerned. And they would they would see the, these these little instances, right? Like Josh Peck's uh, dad, not Josh Peck. Wow, um, Drake Bell. His dad talks about how he would see the producer Brian Peck, which we'll go on to talk about in a second. Like rubbing like the like Drake Bell's shoulder or like grazing his arm or stuff like that, putting his arm around him. Uh, people talk about Dan Schneider going back to him, uh, the child actor. Somebody would always be massaging him. Just weird things and stuff like that. And so one of the parents of uh, one of the black actors on the show was talking about this. And, and they basically turned it around on her saying that, you know, she could, like, disturb the peace. And if she kept, you know, butting in on other people's business, like, they would take her son off the show. Let's see what else does this video go on to say. Uh, several former Nickelodeon child stars and employees also claimed he allegedly fostered a toxic work environment as well as tormented and humiliated the cast and crew on his TV series and sets. So going on, he he said this as well. Here we go. This is right here. So a spokesperson for Sh uh, Schneider told Page Six he was truly sorry for everything that happened. That's the quote. Dan expected and asked a lot from his teams. They worked long hours and consistently made cons uh, successful shows. In the challenges of production, Dan could get frustrated at times, and he understands why some employees found that intimidating and stressful. And so, stuff like this kept going on. After every episode, which again, there were four episodes on Quiet on the Set, uh, they would have the same response from Nickelodeon posted, um, we continue to work to foster a healthy work environment, and we condemn these acts. Something to that degree, okay? So... To put it in perspective, everybody, there was a lot of shady stuff that was happening at Nickelodeon. Like, I'll play this, for example. This is a clip, uh, Ariana Grande on Sam and Cat, 
and it was kind of like the bloopers that they said. So they posted this on YouTube, and you could decide for yourself if this looks sexual or or if this is odd at all. But this is like some of the the innuendos that were popping up on Nickelodeon shows. So here we go. Yeah, you see, you see the sexual connotations. Really? Like, why is this on a kid's show? This is the weirdest one. So the potato obviously looks like a, a dick. Um, and you'll see what happens. Like, really? This one's also really bad. Like, really? You don't see the sexual connotations here, and this was a kid's show. Like, really? What, what does this look like? Give up the juice? Okay, so there's that. Um, gosh. And then there's another video that resurfaced of uh, Dan Schneider and Amanda Bynes in a hot tub. So we're going to we're gonna watch that real quick. Where'd it go? We're going to watch that real quick. And I, I, I just want to show this to you because this is very disturbing. So here we go. Let's maximize it. And once again, this was him and her on TV. I'll just show you. And so you see him in the hot tub with her. And he's wearing all his clothes, but she's obviously in a bathing suit. Isn't it odd, though? Isn't it odd? Like, this isn't weird at all. Like, I, I, I struggle with the people on the set. Like, weren't these ideas, like, in the writer's room when they pitched this? Wasn't this a little bit weird? I mean, look at this. I don't know what this is. Okay, enough of that. But like, you see what I mean? Like, this is... It's not normal. None of these things are normal. And it shouldn't be on kids' TV either. It shouldn't. It, none of this should have been on kids' TV. And so, looking back on it, it looks really bad. There's also a clip, which I, I wasn't able to find. But there was also a clip of Brian Peck, who they introduced you to in, I believe, the second episode. Or the, or the beginning of the... Uh, or end of the first, sorry. Brian Peck. So, there's three pedophile... Let me preface this. Let me go back. There's three pedophile producers on the set. Uh, the first one, I forget the name, but they talk about the first producer and how he was so down to earth. All the parents trusted him, and then it came out that he was a pedophile. Um, the one child star, which I forget her name as well, but the mother says that he would go back and forth emailing her daughter, and she thought it was fine, wholesome, because this guy appeared to be a good Christian man, as he appeared. He appeared to be this guy. Um, one of the other child actors was saying you know, he would go to Bible studies and stuff like that with her and attend, uh, would say how he loves God and is so happy to be working with all of them and said how like half the week he would work for free. And then it came out that he sent a picture of his penis to this young 11-year-old child actress. 
And so they didn't what, – what's crazy about this is that the mom didn't want to do anything because she didn't want to look like a bad mother. That's what she said. She didn't want to look like a bad mother, and so she just wanted to be done with it. Um, and so that's it. They kind of leave her at that. But eventually the, this this guy, it comes out that you know he has – hours and hours of child pornography at his house and, and, and out like pictures a bunch of pictures incriminating him and so he gets fired but he was still allowed to work on the set and then so then you have this guy named Brian Peck and Brian Peck was the second guy that got arrested here on uh, Nickelodeon for being a pedophile and so Brian Peck was a terrible man or is a terrible man to 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 kind of put it in perspective here Brian Peck was another producer on on the set of Nickelodeon and so what you learn is that when he passed the background check because he had no prior like accusations of, of pedophilia or no 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 ties to being a pedophile or a criminal or a piece of shit at all and what we learn is that slowly these things start to come out. So there, there's there's footage of him all the way back in like the early 90s. He's worked with the top of the top, right? And so naturally at this time, he's in with the, the minds of Hollywood, the producers, the higher ups. There's clips of him all the way back to when DiCaprio was a kid, when he was like 14. And he's like grazing DiCaprio's arm. He's touching him. He's hugging him like... Stuff that a grown man shouldn't do to a child, let alone a child actor who's who's in front of the world like that. And so going back, it's easy to find these clips, but nobody thought anything of it. And so in the documentary, then you fast forward and at the end of episode two, it shows that somebody was molested by Brian Peck, uh, molested, sexually assaulted, everything. And. Nobody knew who it was. This person kept it quiet the whole time. And then out of the darkness comes Drake Bell. And it's like, oh, shit. Mic drop moment. That he was the one that was molested by Brian Peck, sexually assaulted. This documentary was crazy. And then it all started to come out in episode three. And so episode two was more like just like the culture that Dan Schneider created. He was a piece of shit boss, uh, racist, sexist tendencies, fostered a terrible work environment. But they, they sprinkled in the pedophilia a little bit for the first producer, who once again, I can't remember his name. And then they kind of sprinkled in Brian Peck a little bit that he was a creep and that he was, you know, odd. But then episode three, they dove into all of the stuff with Drake Bell. And so then it came out that Yes, Drake Bell became uh, like a fixture in this producer Brian Peck's life. And so Brian Peck worked on The Amanda Show, which Drake Bell, uh, Josh Peck was on as well. No no affiliation, no relation. Amanda Bynes, all that. How all these stars got their, their start. And so they, they tell how, you know, Brian Peck worked on, you know, the set or whatever. And how he wanted to, he got very close to Drake Bell in particular. And when the father of Drake Bell, when Drake Bell's dad would see this, and he was like really close to Drake, he says in the in the documentary, he's in the documentary, he says, oh, you know, I uh, I wanted to, you know, make sure I was close to him. I, I was skeptical of everybody, and rightfully so. You're a parent of a 14, 13 year old kid at that time, and he's a big star already in Hollywood, uh, and gaining momentum as well as a star. You want to be sure you're there for him as your parent, as the parent, and so. What kind of what happened after that, he says, was really it's really sad because more and more Drake Bell's dad started to realize these these uh, pedophile tendencies um, of Brian Peck. Nothing that was blatant, but like stuff just like you would see in the DiCaprio video when you go back, grazing his arm, massaging him, rubbing him a little bit too much more than more than a regular adult would do. Uh, very, very creepy, very odd tendencies. And so Drake Bell's dad complained to the, the, the set, the people on the set working with Brian Peck. And the response was really crazy. The response was that these people accused uh, Drake Bell's dad of being homophobic because Brian Peck was apparently gay. And they said, well, you're just homophobic if you, if you believe that. 
And so that kind of made him back off a little bit because he wanted success for his son and he saw that his son love to be on stage. I mean, Drake Bell still says to this day, after everything that happened, he he wouldn't want somebody to be able to have the privilege of being able to do what he did taken away um, because he loved being on stage. But he said this is all it was all really a blur because of all the bad stuff that happened to him. And so eventually what happened was they took uh, Drake Bell's dad away from him basically they they had drake bell turn on his dad a little bit and brian peck said well you know your dad's holding you back and then brian peck be, became like closer and closer with drake bell this is not good stuff at all and so then i'm trying to find it right now there was there was a video uh an infamous video of brian peck just to show you like the the connotation here um brian peck like i said he worked on the uh the set of all that and one of the telling signs, I'm trying to find this video, but I can't. He was called Pickle Boy. That was Brian Peck's role. He was also like an actor on the show. Here we go. <clears throat> he was called Pickle Boy. That was like his thing on all that. And once again, the sexual connotations on Nickelodeon were really, really bad. And so we're, we're just going to get into it. But here we go. This is Brian Peck. He's, he's Pickle Boy or Pickle Man. And he's often interacting with a celebrity. This is right from the, from the documentary. And so this is Brian Peck. He's holding pickles. Ray Romano's a guest star. And so the pickle, what's this look like right here? What does this look like realistically? Because the sexual connotation, it's a, it's a glory hole. That's what, it, that's what it looks like, you know? And so this is like... They show this, and then they show more and more, like, clips of Brian Peck and the parents talking about Brian Peck and how everybody was afraid to say something because they didn't want to, number one, be seen as a, as a homophobe, number two, uh, appear to be disrupting everything on the set and thus putting their child's career in danger, and they don't want to ruin their child's career. Rightfully so, I get it. But, like, you're telling me that this connotation isn't sexual at all? A pickle! Look, look at the we pedophile. We just went with it. There, there's one of the it child stars saying look, they just they the just went with Dan it. Schneider, you gotta ask him. There was this referencing to like, oh yeah, Dan just has a weird sense of humor. That was like, this is the, the pickles mom. don't look like penises to you. Exactly. <laughs> if you're streaming this, I apologize. You gotta watch it on YouTube. This is a children's television show. Wait, why is this in the show? What is what is the joke here exactly? There's this weird element of like they all were able to like pull a fast one and get away with it. And that's like a part of the joke. Well, I, I'll tell you one thing. That show wasn't funny at all. It was terrible. How are you able to do that as as a human being? You know what I mean? How is that something that just you 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 I, it's not even funny. You know what I mean? That wasn't even funny. And so I don't personally get it. It doesn't make sense to me. I don't... I don't know. But ultimately, these things continue to happen. And then so what they go on to do is they continue to talk about Brian Peck, particularly, particularly Drake Bell. And what happened then was really frightening and, and, and disturbing too. So then the, the documentary goes on. And so now Drake Bell's father has been removed, basically. Um, his parents got divorced. His mother is, like, the main one that's, like, looking after him. And so Drake Bell talks about how his mother didn't really want to drive in and out to L.A. every day and stuff like that because it was an hour drive. He lived in Orange County. Everything else was in, uh, you know, L.A. And so hour drive, he tells that his mom didn't like driving, whatever, and so Brian Peck did it. And sometimes, conveniently, Brian Peck would have Drake stay over his house as a 13, 14-year-old boy, and so on and so forth. And he said, at first, the encounters were kind of, like, innocent, and then it got to the point where it was, like, uh, sexual exploitation and, and molestation. Drake Bell even talks about how, when they ask, when the lady asks him, like, what exactly happened how bad was it and he says picture the worst thing that you know an adult could do to a to a to a little child basically like he he's not even able to fathom uh not fathom he's not even able to 
say it in words, which is really disturbing. And so more and more comes out. Uh, they talk about how Brian Peck openly was a pen pal with John Wayne Gacy. And, and that was really interesting too because nobody, once again, it seems like nobody like pointed this out that he was like something was a little bit off you know um and so right here we'll we'll, we'll read it right now i want to i want to read it real quick here so it says right here what i'm not seeing uh this is from somebody that watched the documentary by the way uh what i'm not seeing uh, talked about enough right now is that brian peck was pen pals with john wayne gacy uh, the serial killer who murdered 33 boys and men with a signed self-portrait of Gacy as Pogo the Clown shown off in his home for guests to see, and nobody knew what his info, like what he was into at all. And this is true, by the way. Uh, Drake Bell talks about how, yeah, we, we went over Brian's house all the time. Where they would have kids' parties there. His birthday party was actually moved there because, against his dad's wishes, mind you, because it was closer to where everybody else lived in Hollywood, in, in L.A. And so... They they keep talking about the build up keeps going how Brian Peck more and more finally, um you know was being exposed and people were starting to ask questions, and then Drake Bell says finally what happened was he actually moved in kind of with his girlfriend he was living with his girlfriend at the time, and he would get calls, one two three four five six calls, and then it ended up being forty missed calls from this adult. And he says, girlfriend's mom took him in the other room, uh, closed the door, and said, like, this isn't normal. And so then we, we find out that he said, yeah, you know, this is a little odd. And then as it continues to go on, he said he was on the phone with his mom one day, and all of a sudden he just, he's uh, Drake Bell, he just exploded and screamed and everything came out. And so then what happened was Brian Peck was eventually arrested, went to jail, and but there had a trial. And Drake Bell says he describes... The whole side of Brian Peck's whole side of the courtroom was full, but it was just him on his side. It was just him, his mom, and his brother. And so this is something that I wanted to point out to kind of closing this whole this talk about the documentary. What I found fascinating too was they actually named four actors uh, that were at the trial or that signed letters. So in the in the documentary, um, when talking about Brian Peck. There were a lot of celebrities that defended him, a lot of people in Hollywood that defended him, higher-ups. So we're talking about producers, we're talking about actors, we're talking about uh, writers, directors even, because they worked with him. And so I found this kind of telling. So here's a tweet of the four men who wrote letters of support for Brian Peck when he was 41. Excuse me. After uh, it was revealed that he was raping Drake Bell from the ages of 14 to 15. Mind you, these are accusations, obviously, at the time. But, I mean, it, it's 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 bad. And so, the actor who, first of all, the four actors um, who signed letters supporting Brian Peck saying, you know, this is a man of character. This is a good man. I've worked with him so many times. Um, I some One director said, I, I look forward to working with him again, which that was a little bit weird. But here are the names of the four actors that defended Brian Peck at the time, wrote letters to the judge supporting the pedophile, convicted pedophile, mind you, Brian Peck, or almost convicted at the time. James Marsden, Ryder Strong, Will Freddy, uh, Tehran Killam. But the one right here that's uh, really telling, the, the big one uh, that you would probably know is James Marsden. We'll look at this again. He is in the Sonic movies. He's Sonic's sidekick. He played Cyclops in the X-Men, and he has a lot of other roles, too, in various movies and TV shows. He's, I'd call him like a B or C lister, but he's a very popular actor, nevertheless. And so this guy right here wrote a letter to the judge in the case, supporting Brian Peck and defending Brian Peck, this, this pedophile, awful person, uh, saying, this is a man of character, this is a good man, I, 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 I support him. And like... I'm sorry, that, that's that's crazy. That uh, is very telling because Hollywood is not, once again, I said this last week, Hollywood is not a place of morality. It's not a place of, which is odd once again because they talk about all the time how you need to be more like them and, and you need to be living your life according to this one specific mindset, this like more or less liberal mindset, um, which often might have good intentions, but when practiced, it, it's not. 
palpable. The, these things that they expect you to live by. These things like, once again, t- telling you you don't need a gas-powered stove or you don't need a gas-powered car. Or the whole Me Too movement, which is actually brought up in the documentary, too. It's just really telling. Hollywood is not a good place. They try to proclaim like they're like they're a moral people, but they're really not. It's very frustrating to see all these kids that were hurt. You know, it, 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 it's shocking and it's sad. You just feel for these kids. You feel for the families after watching this whole thing. This is not it's not a happy it's not a cool documentary, but it, it's a shocking. And so after that, there were a couple reports as well um, that uh, were really shocking Um once again, it goes back to Dan Schneider. So now the um, spotlight's on Brian Peck. Um, and there was another pedophile that was uh, working on the set. He was a producer, but they quickly gazed over it. So then they go back to Dan Schneider. And the reports were that he didn't know. But ultimately, in 2018, what happened was they fired him. They paid him $7 million to go away. And that was that. They terminated the, the relationship with him, and that was that. And so I, I just want to play a couple more before we're done talking about this documentary. I want to play a couple more clips um, of like creepy acts from Dan Schneider because I just want to set precedent like this is not a good guy despite what he keeps saying he's not a good person this is not a good guy so here's a clip of Miranda Cosgrove uh, trying to move away from Dan Schneider at her 18th birthday party so here we go honestly in trying to figure out what I could say today about Miss Miranda for her birthday I come to the conclusion that what you can say is what can't you say? Look at I him mean, honest grabbing God, her. I and go on and on she doesn't want it. You could tell she's not a fan. About Miranda, but Look, I putting his arm around her. And I will consolidate it to just this one thing. It's not cool. In all the years I've known Miranda, I guess nine years now. But he's the she boss. She hasn't changed. Miranda hasn't changed one bit. All those awesome qualities that she had when she was nine years old. Okay, enough All the that. goodness, all those smiles. So they, they talk about how he would fire people on the spot like that. This was not a good guy. Here's another clip that I wanted to I wanted to show. Or actually not a clip, some that I wanted to talk about because this is a this is quite shocking and quite I don't even have a word to describe for this. And this is not the only accusation or rumor that this happened. So Zoe 101, uh the show where to go? The show with uh Jamie Lynn Spears. She starred in it and actually in the documentary one of these stars of uh, Zoe 101 was actually being interviewed. But Jamie Lynn Spears was on Zoe 101. Like I said, she was the star. And this tweet was kind of telling. And, and, and this is a rumor. Nobody knows if this is true or not. But these are just allegations kind of just coming out. And so right here, this guy, Isaac's Army. But this is you know a rumor. He's repeating a rumor. So the rumor is that Dan Schneider, former Nickelodeon producer, is the father of Jamie Lynn Spears' daughter. What? He goes on to saying she had to leave Nickelodeon because she had become pregnant as a teen. The guy said, what do you think? There's another accusation, which is also quite telling. Uh, I apologize if you're seeing this new stuff. We'll get to that in a second. But this is the big thing. And so right here, here's another uh, another rumor, essentially. But nevertheless, I mean, people have these, these suspicions for a reason. There's a rumor that Amanda Bynes was forced to go have an abortion because Dan Schneider got her pregnant when she was 13, 13 years old. Now, this is only a rumor, but if this is true, this guy deserves to rot in hell. This guy's a piece of shit already, but how, how did they cover this up? Seriously, Dan Schneider was married at the time, and but the rumor is that Amanda Bynes, star of the Amanda show, um, they talk about her all throughout the documentary as this talented young girl and being exploited for fame. Uh, she had a conservative ship with her parents. This whole thing. Just like uh, Britney Spears. But if this is true, if Amanda Bynes really was forced to get an abortion because Dan Schneider got her pregnant, not, number one, he was raping her. Number two, I, the fact that he, he forced her to get an abortion, regard, it, it, this guy's a piece of shit. And so the, if this rumor is true, he deserves to rot in hell forever. This is awful. This this man is not a moral person. Once again, going back to Hollywood, these are not moral people. All these people are not. No matter what they try to say, no matter what they try to preach, these people are not good people. So this really, this whole documentary, what it went to show is, it ended with Drake Bell and his dad. And he talked about everything that happened. And they, they repaired their relationship. And he said, his dad, he, you know, his dad has his arm around him. 
and they're walking out of the studio, out of the set of the documentary, and he said, uh, better years are going to come. Basically, better years are to come. And Drake Bell said, well, I hope so. And that was it. And then they once again had the like disclaimer. Nickelodeon has been, you know, continued to ensure they're fostering a, you know, a positive work environment, whatever. But this whole thing to kind of put that, wow, we're, we're 34 minutes and to put that to a close, man, this is this whole thing was really telling, uh, really sad to watch. I, my heart breaks for all these kids who are now adults and all the parents, all the family is you're not able to get that back. And just seeing how mostly the, the biggest uh, probably role in the documentary as a parent of a child star was uh, Drake Bell's dad. And so seeing his heartbreak, he said, like, I, I you can't I, he's still not over it, which as a parent, I can't even imagine how you'd be able to get over the fact that somebody was molesting your son and, and you tried to he tried. There were warning signs. He was he saw warning signs and when he said something he was immediately like thrown down accused of being homophobic uh, this is this is sad shit man it's it's it's, it, it's just these people in hollywood once again um i hate to keep ringing this this beating a dead horse but i'm gonna do it anyway I talked about this last week, like, these people in Hollywood, like, the cover-ups, the pedophilia in Hollywood is real, and they talk about the Me Too movement briefly, um, about Harvey Weinstein, Kevin Spacey, Bill Cosby, right, all these celebrities, uh, R. Kelly, how it all, all the, all the stuff came out, Re realistically, I feel like the Me Too movement, and I told my fiance when we were watching all this, I mean, despite the flack that the Me Too movement has caused, I feel like it's a net positive, I truly do, um, there are standards now, and I don't understand how this was possible to not have standards of, like, what harassment actually is in the workplace versus what it's not. Um, maybe the overcorrect was bad, but, I mean, I, I would rather live in a world where the, the sick fucks are kept away, you know what I mean? It's just, it's chilling. It's a, it's a scary, it's a, it's a horrifying thing, and... You see all the child actors, they say, you know, they ask. One of them was asked, um, would you ever have your child act? And the one actress said immediately, no, no. I don't even, I don't even pause to think about it, no. More and more is coming out, man. More and more is coming out about Hollywood and about what really happens behind the curtains. That's all, it's... It's really sad. Anyway, speaking of Hollywood, we are going to pivot to something else because, frankly, I don't want to talk about it anymore. We're going to pivot to something else. So there is a show. You guys are a friend of Star Wars. I'm a friend of Star Wars. Friend of Star Wars. Fan of Star Wars. Are you fans of Star Wars? I love Star Wars. Star Wars is probably my favorite brand, aside from Marvel, ever favorite international uh, intellectual intellectual property international property ip uh favorite thing i love star wars and so guys we have a new star wars show and we have a trailer what's it called let me give you a little background real quick and pivot okay you're a fan of uh the prequel trilogy uh phantom menace attack of the clones revenge of the sith right i personally am a fan i was always a fan growing up uh, watching the prequels well, Star Wars The Acolyte is coming out June 4th on Disney+. Plus. And what it is, it's 100 years before The Phantom Menace. So the events of Phantom Menace, when Anakin is a young boy, they show his how he was um, on Tatooine, and then they take him away, right? He becomes a Jedi, whatever, whatever. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is we're going to react to the first trailer that came out a couple days ago for uh, The Acolyte. I haven't seen it yet. So this should be very interesting, and I can't wait to watch Um I'm amped for this because this is a crazy period in Star Wars history uh, in the timeline that we often don't see. Uh, the High Republic, it's just so interesting. So here we go. Oh, something with the sound. There we go. All right, so this is the trailer for the Acolyte, and we're going to react to it. Here we go. Close your eyes. Your eyes can deceive you. 
We must not trust them. That's cool. Tell me what comes into your mind. Life. Balance. I see fire. Who's that? Oh shit. Someone is killing Jedi. Oh, the sense. yellow lightsaber. Oh, no way. That's the Wookiee. That's the Wookiee Jedi going back. Let's go back to that real quick. We're gonna go back to that. Doesn't make sense. I wanna I wanna let you guys know that this is right here. This 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 is what I wanted to see really. This is the Wookiee. So you guys know Chewbacca. It's the same species as Chewbacca. And so this is the Wookiee Jedi. Really cool character. I don't know much about him. I don't know much about this time. I, I've read some Star Wars comics, but this, I, I cannot wait to see more of him. Let's see if he's in the rest of the trailer. What happened? I sensed the darkness. This is about power and who is allowed to use it. What is that? Oh shit. Who is that? That's cool. Oh shit. Alright. I could I could get down with this. Okay. Solid trailer. Solid trailer. That did everything it needed to do. Everything it needed to do, it did. A hundred percent. That trailer, okay, that's a teaser trailer. So it's the first one. It's not designed to give us much information, but enough to keep us like engaged and wanting more, and rightfully so. That trailer um, kind of got me excited. Now, basically, the preface of it from watching the trailer is that um, there was a thousand years of peace uh, for the Jedi, and so save that there was a thousand years of peace or, or a certain period of peace uh in the jedi order uh for the jedi and then the sith came and so i don't know how they're gonna do this really because in the phantom menace uh kiato mundi i think that's how you pronounce his name he's the jedi with the pointy head the really pointy head he talks about how there hasn't been a sith for millennia a millennia and so it'll be interesting to see how the, this goes because obviously we just saw a sith and that was a hundred years before the phantom menace so that'll be interesting. Overall, um, I'm not going to lie. Uh, Star Wars has been hit and miss for me recently. It has been. Um, if we want to go since the new sequel trilogy came out, I was a fan of uh, the first one that they that they did. But then The Last Jedi and The Rise of Skywalker, I wasn't really a fan of. I was a fan of Force Awakens. I will say that. I appreciate that they tried to kind of retcon things in the Rats of Skywalker, but it really didn't stick with me. Um, mainly in in the in the Last Jedi, my biggest quarrel wasn't with Rey. I was actually I'm a fan of Rey. Rey's a good character in my opinion. Um, is she a little bit overpowered? Yes, but they kind of explained it with her being a Palpatine. Anyway, not the point. <clears throat> the fact that they killed Snoke off uh, right in the middle of the of the Last Jedi who was being built up in The Force Awakens as the main Palpatine-like villain. The fact that they, they killed him off, I remember I was there. There was years of speculation. People like made millions of dollars on YouTube speculating, who is Snoke? What is he? When in reality, they, they killed him off, and then they wrote him in as like Palpatine was like using Snoke as like his proxy. And so that that was really disappointing to see. I wasn't a fan of that. But nevertheless, I mean, so I wasn't a fan of the, the last two sequels. I was a fan of Force, Force Awakens, building it up. They killed Han Solo, which was a shock. I mean, I, I remember watching it with my dad and my brothers, and my dad was like, oh, you better not do that to me. He yelled it. Um, you could feel the tension there. I, I don't like that they killed off Han Solo, but nevertheless, it was a really good movie, in my opinion. I, I, I will still watch it again. 
So The Last Jedi and Rise of Skywalker, not the biggest fan. It's a bunch of like cameo porn in the in the Rise of Skywalker, in my opinion. I didn't like that. But you know, they tried. Whatever. So we go on. I love Rogue One. I think everybody loves Rogue One. I couldn't really do solo a Star Wars story. Wasn't really a fan of it. Um, because it wasn't it wasn't Harrison Ford. I mean, I get it. You're trying to, you know, tell when he was younger, but it still wasn't Harrison Ford, so I didn't really jive with it. Love seeing Darth Maul at the end though. That was awesome. Mandalorian, I think it's obvious that Mandalorian was a huge success. Right, so we're not even gonna I'm just gonna keep going. Uh Book of Boba Fett. I was mixed because Boba Fett's not an anti-hero. He's not a good guy, but they made him more of like a hero slash anti-hero when in reality he should be bad guy slash anti-hero. So I'm not really a fan of that per se. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I, I watched it. It was fine. I like that Cad Bane came in there, but then they killed Cad Bane off. But then in, in reality, Cad Bane's got to be like in this 80s when, when he comes in that, in that show. So I get it. Uh, so I was mixed on Book of Boba Fett. Uh... I'm not going to reference the animated shows because those are all pretty good. I'm talking about like the live action. So Andor, I'm not going to lie. Andor was really good. I, I enjoyed Andor. I haven't finished it yet, though. Um, I'm a late bloomer in that regard. Um, but the episodes that I have started to recently watch, like I'm a fan of it. I love like that period of time where like the Empire and stuff like that, they're, they're rebelling. The rebellion really starts like that's cool. You know what I mean? Just the politics of all of it. Andor's a really cool show. Uh, Ahsoka was a great show. I was a fan of Ahsoka. I it, It's so sad that um, Balin, the actor who, who played him, died. Because they could have done so much more with that character. Um, I was a really big fan of that character. Really big fan of the show. Um, everybody that played their part did an excellent job, in my opinion. And so, now we have the accolade. I think that that's all the live action shows. Pretty sure. Now we have the Acolyte. I mean, I don't know. People have been complaining about Star Wars being quote-unquote woke, and I kind of get it, but I think most of it's like toxic fan culture. We'll see. I'm I'm really excited for this trailer. This trailer was awesome. Um, it, it, it wasn't... I, I shouldn't say that. It was good. It wasn't awesome. Um, it did exactly what it needed you to, to see, right? Exactly what it needed to do. Give you a little bit, right? Somebody's killing Jedi who... All those lightsabers, that sequence at the end where you see the, the Sith lightsaber. I don't know much about this time period. I know it's not exactly the Old Republic that we wanted. But nevertheless, we're going to get a movie about the Old Republic eventually. So we'll finally be able to see that, which is awesome. But I guarantee that we will see at least a little bit of Yoda in it. Because Yoda was alive for like 900 years. And so he might have been like 800, 700 at this time. So we'll definitely see a little bit of him, which will be fun. But then something's been going around, too, about the creator of the Acolyte. Um, I think it deserves some attention, in my opinion, which, you know, take my opinion with a grain of salt. It is what it is in that regard. But it's going around about the creator. Um, when I saw Frozen, oh, sure. as, a, as a grown up. It's going around about the creator of the Acolyte. And so I think this does deserve attention. So everybody knows the account and wokeness on Twitter or X. Um, this is right here, LGBTQ plus activist, uh, Leslie Headland is the new director in the Star Wars franchise. Uh, her goal in the film? To make it LGBTQ inclusive and similar to Disney fairy tales. And so, I guess that she is the director of The Acolyte? I don't know. I'm pretty sure she is. Anyway, let's see what she has to say here. Um, when I saw Frozen as a as a grown ass woman, I um, I cried through the entire movie. Uh, there was just something about the relationship between the sisters, the the like de villainization of uh, the classic kind of fairy tale bad bad guy. You know, um, uh, the concept I of agree. true I, love I being cool. between two sisters and not a heterosexual relationship. Like there it, it just mm -hmm. it just destroyed me completely. And I thought. Gosh, you know, I would love to make something like this that is, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, Disney, meaning it's something that, like, my parents would have allowed me to see when I was younger as a queer person. Uh, which, but I would have been able to understand as a queer person, and I think I, I would have had... Is. As a queer person. Let's continue. 
a completely different life. And so I really was inspired by it and was like, God, I would love to make a story like this. Um, and so when I was developing this original idea to pitch to Kathleen, um, I thought, well, you know, it can't just be that, you know, when you're pitching Star Wars, you have to pull from what, you know, George was also interested in. Like, it can't just be like, well, I'm referencing, especially if you're going to set something, you know, in the, during the High Republic or end of High Republic into prequels, you, you don't have the Skywalker saga. Like, you can't reference a character that was created by George and or Filoni. Like, you have to create your own new characters. Honestly, people were making a big deal about this, and, and we'll we'll read. I, like I said, I, I read tweets about it, and we'll continue to read the tweets. But like, I don't know if that was the necessarily the worst speech. I I think she said as a queer person, which people are taking out of context. But she's talking about how Frozen was, and rightfully so. I mean, these tropes of heterosexual relationships, right? Uh, classic fairy tales could get, let's be honest, a little bit tired. And so what they did was instead of, you know, talking about a relationship between a man and a woman, they talked in a, a love story. What they talked about was two sisters, you know, love for each other as sisters. I understand what she's saying. The, the, the end wokeness kind of takes it out of context a little bit. But her saying that as a queer person kind of reels, reels it back in. I mean, you could be queer and still make good stuff. You know, I understand that. A lot of Star Wars fans, including myself, have grown tired of, like, just, like, the overtly, like, woke, I guess you could say, with them firing Gina Carano probably is, is the most, uh, probably the biggest thing you could point to, um, and just, like, little things that are sprinkled in, but this isn't that bad to me. Watching this clip, uh, a minute 19, this isn't that bad. I, I mean, I understand why people are overreacting because she's saying as a queer person, I didn't, uh, I was glad to see that a movie didn't highlight heterosexual relationships and maybe she's bitter because uh, she's not a heterosexual person. Okay. Um, I mean, we'll see how the acolyte is because she's the director. Um, I'm optimistic still. I'm not going to hate on anything yet. I try not to hate on anything until like I, I, it gets there. I try not to hate something before I watch it. This will be interesting, man. This will, this will be interesting. I'm excited still. I mean, it doesn't, it, it looks good. Like I said, it looks cool. There's enough stuff for me to be interested in. And like I said, that was, that was just the first trailer. It was the teaser. So we'll see what happens regarding that. Uh, we're going to transition. <laughs> Speak. Oh boy! Speaking of queer, we're gonna transition. Um, this is our last topic of the day, and then I'm gonna stop talking and just post the episode. So, uh, you guys have been following the whole Trump thing because I'm not even gonna talk about this thing that I wanted to talk about. Have you guys been following uh the whole Trump bloodbath thing? It's a very interesting uh a very interesting topic, and so basically, Trump was at a rally. I think it was in Ohio, and he was talking about. Um, China and how China took our, a lot of our manufacturing and specifically uh, automobile manufacturing jobs. And so he talks about how if he's to become president again, it'll be a bloodbath. Uh, really what I wanted to do is just, we'll just watch this and, you know, I'll have you guys decide for yourselves. Uh, but here is the mainstream media reaction to what he said and, and you can kind of get a good connotation of what happens after that. So here we go. From the hospital. All righty, let's let's go back. Okay, here we go. Play, play. There we you go. see the spirit from the hostages, and that's what they are—is hostages. They've been treated terribly and very unfairly, and you know that, and everybody knows that. And we're going to be working on that. So that the first day we get into office, we're going to save our country, and we're going to work with the people to treat those unbelievable patriots and they were unbelievable patriots and are well i think it's very unfortunate at a time that there that's are american hostages that's not what i wanted to watch that's not what i wanted to see here where is it where is the clip here we go i think this is it uh, i don't want to hear the ad our democracy depends on you Hold on. Basically, what I wanted to do is I'm trying to find the clip of when they talk about 
uh, that Trump is calling for a bloodbath. Are we going to see that? No. Okay. So, basically what the mainstream media did was they took it out of context and they said that it would be, uh, Trump was calling for a bloodbath. But here's here's the real clip. Here's the whole clip, rather. So we're going to watch this and you'll be able to see this time actually uh, what, what Trump said. And I think it's more telling that the mainstream media tried to yet again frame him for saying something that he didn't necessarily say. So here we go. We're going to we're going to watch the whole thing. Here's the full clip. So he this is everybody just to clarify. He did not say it was a bloodbath. It would be a bloodbath if he was to win reelection. Here's what he actually said. China now is building a couple of massive plants where they're going to build the cars in Mexico and think, they think, that they're going to sell those cars into the United States with no tax at the border. Let me tell you something to China. If you're listening, President Xi, and you and I are friends, but he understands the way I deal, those big monster car manufacturing plants that you're building in Mexico right now, and you think you're going to get that, you're going to not hire Americans, and you're going to sell the cars to us now, we're going to put a 100% tariff on every single car that comes across the line. That'll work. And you're not going to be able to sell those cars. If I get elected, Here now if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for the whole... Okay, they cut it off right there. That's where the mainstream media cut off. He said, if I don't get reelected, it's going to be a bloodbath. But let's finish the clip. Oh, that's going to be the least of it. It's going to be a bloodbath for the country. That'll be the least of it. But they're not going to sell those cars. They're building massive factories. A friend See, of mine, he's talking about an economic bloodbath. Not that it's going to be a literal bloodbath, an economic bloodbath if he doesn't get back. That's what he was saying. Walk across the street, and that way he's like Biden. But for building a plant, he can do the greatest plants in the Isn't world. Isn't that what he's right? talking about? Okay, so the mainstream media were caught once again. Um, you want to call it propaganda. You want to call it uh, a half truth, whatever. But it, 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 once again, it is it is very clear that they're taking his words out of context. So <clears throat> MSNBC right here. Here's the tweet from that. Right. So they tweeted an article. Trump says there will be a quote unquote bloodbath if he loses the election. Ah, but the community notes. The community notes said readers added context. They thought people might want to know. Donald Trump was talking about the automobile manufacturing industry and potential economic turmoil, not political violence like everybody in the mainstream media was saying. It's very interesting. So I want to I want to point something else out too. Uh, naturally, right? People came to the defense of Trump, um, and some even mainstream media figureheads were pointing out like, "You guys took this out of context." One person in particular was Stephen A. Smith. And here's what he had to say about that. Here we go. There was a website called The Spun that released an article about me. Hold on. And when I responded and tagged Elon Musk's video. Here we go. You that released by Elon Musk on a speech that Trump was giving the other day. Here it is. And when I responded and tagged Elon Musk's video, here is what I said. Based purely on this video, if it is accurate, then it would be true. It seems real Donald Trump's words were taken out of context. Reading the headlines, I've read, fair is fair. I posted this in response mm. to the owner of Tesla and X, the one and only Elon Musk. So right there, even Stephen A. Smith, who is no fan of Trump, absolutely no fan of Trump. We're going to put the, the laptop down. Stephen A. Smith, who is no fan of Trump whatsoever, oh boy, uh, defended him on that part, saying that, yeah, everybody took him out of context and that the, if you guys continue to do this, then people just aren't going to trust you. And so that's true. It's been an hour, and I'm done talking. I, my voice hurts. It's, it's, it's a little bit much now. My head hurts. Um, I've been wearing this, this, these headphones for too long. I didn't address them uh, before I started recording. It's been a good hour. Hopefully, people watch. <sighs> um, please subscribe, by the way. Everybody, please subscribe. Um, I need it, and. 
yeah we'll, we'll see you next episode it's been a pleasure as always uh so we'll see you